Hi there, welcome to another update on the developing volcanic situation in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. I had two updates yesterday on November 10th and right now it's November 11th, Saturday. It is about 1030 Mountain Standard Time, which I guess would be about 5.30 p.m. in Iceland on their local time. I uh, just want to update you a little bit on what's been going on over the past uh, 12 to 18 hours or so and look at some of the data and then talk about where this might actually go. So to bring you up to speed a little bit here, we've been seeing earthquake activity in the area. Some folks wanted to see uh, the sites of the eruptions that took place, the last three eruptions that took place in the region. So you can see the March to September 2021 eruption here, followed by the August 2022. And then earlier this year, the summer 2023, we had an eruption in this area. Uh, the area of focus right now is this area uh, in and around Grindavik, this uh, fishing village, and the area to the north. Here's the Blue Lagoon, the number one tourist destination in Iceland, and the nearby geothermal power plant, which is also a piece of infrastructure that's been um, a bit of concern. Um, and so remember that we saw an area of seismic activity and uplift occurring just to the south and west of the Blue Lagoon area. And that was our primary focus for probably a few days, maybe a week or two, going from the end of October into November. And then that all changed pretty dramatically on, I think, Wednesday and Thursday as the earthquake activity shifted over uh, across the, the road here, Road 43, and ended up being concentrated in this region here. Now there's an old set of craters here, the Sundukar craters that erupted between two to 3,000 years ago. And these craters and their eruption a few thousand years ago is, uh, you can see the lava flows coming down here to the coastline. These lava flows uh, represent the land that Grindavik uh, is situated on. So these lava flows and their volcanic vents um, form this land that we see in this area. And this is the area we're looking at now. And so what happened yesterday on Friday, November 10th, was the earthquake activity started to extend further to the southwest. And I sort of speculated at the time that maybe the magma body was moving, propagating, almost like a pair of scissors opening, if you want to think of it that way, further to the southwest as you're injecting more magma into these, into, into the system, the magma needs to make more room for itself. And it does that by exploiting fractures and weaknesses in the rock and then forcing its way through those. And as it forces its way through the rock, that generates earthquakes. Earthquakes are nothing more than rocks breaking. And then that breakage of rock is transmitted as seismic energy, which causes the shaking that occurs and is associated with those earthquakes. And so what we have now is a magma intrusion that possibly extends uh, across this distance you see here. So we started picking up late yesterday on Friday, earthquakes moving to the southwest, some of those earthquakes occurring right underneath the town of Grindavik, and then some of them also offshore. And so some of these were quite large in the magnitude three to four range, um, obviously shaking the people that were there. There was an evacuation ordered yesterday at about midnight or so local time. And as far as I know, that went pretty uh, well, pretty orderly and efficient. Uh, the good people of Iceland are good at doing that sort of thing in terms of just, you know, not panicking, doing what needs to be done, just kind of buckling down and getting things done. So as far as we know, uh, that's gone pretty well uh, in terms of getting people out of harm's way. And so now the real, the real um, test begins in terms of what will happen next? People are now evacuated. They're out of harm's way. Here's the view of the town right now on the webcam. You can see this is, I believe, one of the, their Coast Guard ships out at sea. You might see the webcam uh, vibrate a little bit. Uh, that's mostly wind, although sometimes bigger earthquakes roll through and you see much more pronounced shaking going on. Uh, you might also see some flashing that lights down in here a bit as well, just some of the emergency um, response people that are just kind of making sure everything's okay in town there. But for now, everything's going okay. There's not an eruption that's taken place as of yet, but now the people are evacuated, 
now the waiting game begins and this is where it sort of tests human patience because as people are kept from their homes longer and the eruption doesn't occur um, sometimes that can cause its own set of problems and that people start to doubt uh, the scientist's ability to predict what's going to happen and come up with forecasts and it's almost like you want there to be an eruption now um, now that everyone's out of harm's way but you don't necessarily want an evacu or an eruption that's uh, going to inundate the town and so now it's just a really sort of a mental test i suppose to see how this all plays out and we're still looking at data that's not completely um, conclusive Here, here's uh, the iceland met office data and so you can see just this incredible swarm of quakes situated over southwest Iceland over the last 48 hours. If we look at the plot here, we can see that everything just really ramps up on Friday, right? They even highlight one specific earthquake of 5.2 that occurs uh, later in the day on Friday. Uh, as we look at the more recent data, we can see that it drops a little bit as we go into today on Saturday, that the uh, size of the earthquakes has dropped a bit. The frequency, I think, is still high, not as high. So we're still getting a lot of earthquakes. They're just not as strong or as numerous as they were previously. So that may represent, you know, on Friday, the magma was forcing its way to the southwest, lengthening its zone of uh, the zone it's occupying. And now it's maybe not forcing its way laterally and so things have settled down a little bit also remember on these earthquake magnitudes uh, if you're not familiar with how the scale works here i think everyone intuitively knows that a five's way worse than a four and a four is way worse than a three but remember that the difference between any um, consecutive number like a three to a four in terms of energy released it's about 32 times so in other words a magnitude five is 32 times more in terms of energy released as a magnitude four or in other words it takes 32 magnitude four earthquakes to equal one magnitude five and so an incredible amount of energy has been produced with some of these bigger quakes you know the threes the fours and the fives and above this threshold of about three these are the earthquakes that people are feeling uh, what's also interesting in looking at some of the data here and let's switch over to this other site here um, is we also have a phenomenon that can happen whenever we get earth, swarms of earthquakes where you can actually trigger earthquakes. And so the idea here, so if we just look at earthquakes, let's go magnitude three and above, and let's go, let's go back maybe about 18 hours or so and see how this looks. Um, so you can see the main focus of the earthquakes here around Grindavik. Um, but you can also see some out here to the west, out towards the, the peninsula's tip. There's some back over here, whoops, to the east. Um, a little touchy there. And so what's probably happening here is these other earthquakes likely don't represent magma intrusion. These are just areas that were already under tectonic stress. And because you've introduced these new and bigger earthquakes around Grindavik over the last few days and weeks, um, you can actually trigger a remote earthquake by changing the stress conditions. In other words, if you have places that are already under some tectonic stress and they're probably going to have an earthquake at some point in the future by causing the shaking and that seismic energy reverberating out from this zone in here, that can sometimes cause other more distant earthquakes to occur at a sooner time than they might have otherwise. I hope that makes sense. So it's um, it's called triggering a triggering mechanism and so that might be why we're seeing uh, so many earthquakes remember the stars on this diagram are all threes and above so we're seeing a lot of earthquakes in iceland over the last two days uh, most of that is due to the magma intrusion but there's a good chance that some of these more distant earthquakes are actually being triggered by the seismic activity around that magma intrusion um, if we go to the Met Office's latest update, I want to just walk you through a few of the things they've got listed here. Uh, so they've got around 800 earthquakes uh, over the last, uh, since midnight of last night. Um, again, some of this I think is the, the translation. They say they've been recorded in the subduction zone. This is not a subduction zone in terms of tectonic setting. I think that was just something 
maybe lost in the Icelandic to English translation. So just to be clear, uh, this tectonic setting is not a subduction zone. It is a divergent plate boundary. The plates are spreading apart. There's sometimes a little bit of strike slip or lateral movement as well. Uh, it says the seismic activity has only decreased in the last few hours. That's consistent with the trend we're seeing now, but it's still high. Um, and the most seismic activity has been at the southwest end near Grindavik. And so that's, uh, that's what we see as well, that most of the seismic activity has picked up down here. Um, moving on to their, their text here and some of the things they write in this narrative, um, they're calling it a magma tunnel, probably not the, the verbiage I would use, but I think, again, it's a little bit of a translation thing. Um, it's not really a tunnel. It's not like there's already, already a conduit, a pipe down there that the magma can just occupy. The magma has to make its own space, and it's fighting and pushing through whatever weaknesses or zones, uh, fractures that exist in the rocks that are already there. But it indicates they've got a, a magma body, if you will, uh, extending pretty much the length we see here. We've talked about that. Uh, the depth to the top of that magma north of Grindavik was estimated at one and a half kilometers. That's about a mile down. So the magma not only has lengthened laterally, but it's in some places it's actually moved a little bit closer to the surface. Remember this number a few days ago was in the three to four kilometer range. And so the magma has not only lengthened and moved further along this northwest or excuse me, northeast southwest trend, it's actually moved closer to the surface in some places. Uh, based on the latest GPS data, the speed of the deformation is many times higher than what's been measured in the other upheavals of the Reykjanes Peninsula. So they're seeing the ground is deforming faster and at a rate that they haven't seen previously. Uh, based on these measurements, it seems the size of the magma body and the magma flow are many times what has been measured in recent years. So again, this, this eruption is looking different, uh, different is probably the safe word, but probably bigger than what we've seen in 2021 to 2022 and 2023 uh, to the east near Fagrasjöfjöt. Um, although models indicate the magma extends south of Grindavik, it's unlikely that the magma will emerge, emerge on the seafloor if you look at the history of eruptions in this area. So it doesn't mean it won't happen offshore under the ocean, but it's less likely. Um, and they meet regularly and then they're going to they're putting together more information. So um, so that's what's going on to this point. And so what we would expect then is the most likely eruption site would probably be somewhere on or close to this orange line that I've outlined here because that's where the magma body is. We're not expecting something in the coastal area, although we can't completely rule that out. If we did have a vent open up in the water, that would be a really different monster all in of itself because then you've got lava and water interacting. You're flashing that ocean water to steam. You're generating more explosive conditions. The lava is being uh, expanded dramatically and and burst into ash. And so you'd end up with a, a much more locally explosive eruption if it ends up in the, in the ocean. But again, that's not the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario is a vent opens up somewhere up on the rift. Maybe it's way up here. I just put one in there just, just for um, argument's sake. Um, and then that produces lava fountains. You know, it's throwing clots of lava up into the sky, but they're falling down close to the vent. And then that's feeding lava flows that will start moving down slope. Um, and definitely head towards the town and the ocean while also depending exactly where the vent opens up if it's further down here you know if it's down in this area but if it's further higher up this this uh, linear trend of craters um, there's a good chance that some of this lava does make it over to the west crosses the road and potentially impacts the blue lagoon and or the power plant um, evidently they've been working around the power plant to build a, a wall, um, an embankment of earth material uh, to keep the lava out. That may have some success depending on if they can get it built in time and exactly where the lava goes, but at least they're being proactive. It may end up being a moot point depending on exactly where uh, this eruption begins and where it occurs. Uh, and so I think that's all I've got for you for today. Um, yeah, we looked at some of the earthquake data there. 
Uh, I would just stay tuned, but I'd say the chance of an eruption is still high. Um, this is where it just becomes tricky as humans because we want there to be, you know, we want there to be an eruption because the scientists are saying there's going to be an eruption and the data is pointing towards it. But we really just need to be a little bit patient here and see what happens and see how this plays out. There's a chance, small chance that nothing occurs. Um, there's a chance that the earthquake activity ramps up again. The intrusion maybe lengthens uh, into a different area. We'll just kind of have to see how this plays out. But for now, we've got people evacuated um, out of harm's way, and we'll just have to see what happens. But I'll keep you updated as things occur. Appreciate you joining me and appreciate all your support in helping me put together some of these videos, uh, spending time to share my little bit of knowledge as I'm here in the States with you about this area I've grown to really love and care for, and that's uh, Iceland. So stay well, everyone in Iceland, and we'll keep watching your situation. Thanks.